All right, welcome back to another episode of CMA Podcast. How is everybody doing? Today I am joined by the man, the myth, and the legend that is Kevin Keen. Kevin, how are you doing, sir? All good, man. How are you? Very, very good. Anyone who doesn't know who this handsome gentleman is, he is my brother from the same mother. Biological brothers. Biological brothers right there. <laughs> um, thank you for coming on, man. I appreciate your oh, pleasure. your time and your your vision and your help and your assistance with everything. You've helped me to the nth degree with this podcast, man. Sincere appreciation to you, sir. Oh, of course. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's kind of what I do. I help people figure out what they want to present something like and I help them do it. <clears throat> Amazing. So, yeah, before like this was even a concept before you bought a mic before I bought a camera anything I was kind of thinking yeah I'd, I'd be interested in doing a podcast I'd be interested in talking about things that I enjoy talking about because I, I watch podcasts I listen to podcasts um you know interviewing with people go to journalist school for years to just talk to some celebrities and all of a sudden here I'm talking to UFC fighters and legends in the game and um, but I thought how am I going to do it what how am I going to get there uh, I need to buy a mic I need to buy a program I need to pay somebody to edit it and you come out and say you could just do it yourself yeah I mean nowadays it's so easy I mean technology has legitimately made any kind of projects involving you know entertainment or media extremely easy um and like obviously you know as as you move through life you know you lose touch with certain things and you get better at other things as your as your focus kind of changes so for me like going like i was originally uh like before i was doing what i'm doing now i was selling computers to people so i was very much in the know of what technology was capable of and how easy it was to do things at home so I mean, I, I know that you hadn't worked with computers. I know you had, you know, like worked in the sense that selling them, knowing what's working on the inside, how they operate internally and stuff like that and softwares and whatnot. So I think at the beginning, it can seem quite daunting because you see other podcasts or you see other shows and they've got this huge setup, you know, they've got all these microphones, they've got all this and that. And all of a sudden, you know, it becomes extremely attainable then to do it at home when you see that, oh, it's just a space, you know what I mean? Like they're just, they're not in a studio. This isn't like Howard Stern or anything like that. You're actually in your own house or a lot of these people like started off. I mean, look at Bill Burr, for example, like Bill is literally a laptop, a microphone and him, you know, just talking. So like there's no reason for you not to do it if it's something that you do want to do. I know you were very, very passionate about you know, starting up this podcast and doing something to coincide with your gym. So, um, you know, when I hear somebody talking from the perspective of they want really, they're passionately looking to pursue something, I will absolutely go out of my way to help that, you know, to try and, and, and cultivate that forward. And, you know, once you have the technical side of it down, because it's the same with what I do, you know, you can go about what I do one of two ways. You can go about drawing traditionally on paper, or you can go about drawing digitally on a graphics tablet. And the digital one freaks people out because paper is certainly easier. You know, paper, you just buy a sheet of paper, buy some inks, buy some pencils, and away you go, and maybe a drawing board. But when you're working on digital, you've got to figure out softwares, you've got to figure out how to update things, you've got to figure out how to set up the drawing mechanics to actually suit the way you draw naturally. There's a lot more to it. But once you have that stuff out of the way, and it really doesn't take that long, you know, I was saying this to you in the beginning, once you have the workflow of how to put all the pieces together to make a final product, after that, it's just repetition. You know, it's just reps and making sure that you can do it efficiently. So I'm glad to see that it's gone to where it's gone because, I mean, look, at this time last year, you, you weren't talking to Chuck Liddell, you weren't talking to Bass Rutten, you weren't talking to Stitch. And now all of a sudden, here we are, you know? Yeah, that's the thing. Like, and, and, and to touch on that, it's just like, I thought it would just be me talking into a mic like Bill Burr style, just yeah. him and his warped mind and putting that out to the world. And, and when I got, I started to get guests on the podcast, I really started to enjoy the conversation um, to the point where I want guests on every op episode now. Yeah. Um, but at the beginning, uh, you know, the content 
is there. The content is always there because of what we're doing. Uh, just the physical aspect of getting a podcast uploaded to whatever platform you're using. That's the part I was intimidated with and intimidated by. And like you said, I never forget what you said. Nowadays, it doesn't matter how stupid the question is. There are tutorials on everything on YouTube for whatever you're using. Um, so whether it's a mic, a software program, uh, the video, the audio, just yeah. type in whatever you need followed by tutorial on YouTube and it's there. So it's like basically insert word here for dummies. Pretty much. I mean, yeah. the way I would describe it to everybody is look, YouTube and Google are the two most powerful tools in the world right now. You're not going to get a degree. You're not going to get a diploma. Chris, you're not even going to get a master's at anything, you know, but you will get a fundamental understanding of what it is you need to figure out. And my, my all approach to learning anything modern nowadays is you learn what you need to function. Everything else is a bonus. So when I was first learning how to draw digitally, I had to figure out practically what it was that I needed. What did I actually need to, to use to get a finished product that would impress people and then, you know, open up doors for me. So rather than wasting time trying to work out every little thing and try to do tutorials of every little thing, I worked out, just practically speaking, how do I pencil, how do I ink, how do I finalize the image? And I, I'd already known plenty about, you know, working with computers and, and saving files and whatnot. But when you're working with particular files commercially like I do, you have to work to specifications that publishers and that other people require. So, you know, practically speaking, I had to figure all that out. Like, you know, blissfully naive to the fact that early in my career, I was, you know, I just get paper and I draw and bang, it's done. But I then realized, wait, no, there's like, there's border frames and trim lines and bleeds and cuts that you need to put on your pages so that when they go to a printer, that printer isn't cutting important stuff off. It's not ruining the art. It's not ruining the pages. It's not ruining the work. And once I had all of that stuff figured out, which really only took about a year, realistically, it only took about a year to really nail down exactly how I like to work. And I imagine it's much the same with your process. I imagine, you know, after about four or five long form podcasts, you had kind of worked out the kinks. And after that, it's a case of just smoothening the process out, you know? Yeah, like after the first two episodes where it took me anywhere between two and four hours to edit it and put it together, um, which I thought I would have had to pay somebody to do it. But I'm thinking, all right, this is going to take me learning a process and putting in the hard work. Um, those first two episodes, I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. But then after the third and fourth episode, I could do a 30 minute podcast and edit it within 20 minutes, you know. And that's literally from watching tutorials on YouTube on how to do it and little cheat ways around things. Um, but then it became a pleasure, not just four hours of work. It's like, oh, it our, becomes like a therapy almost. Exactly. And I talked about this with a guy during the week, Matt Stocks. He doesn't edit his podcasts. He just sends yeah. off the files to his network. He's on the, the gas digital network in the US. Okay. And, and he's like, you know, no, I don't do any of the editing stuff. I really enjoy the editing now because it's mine and it's fun, you know? Yeah. And like there's, there's a kind of, um, there's a, it's almost like a, there's a rewarding element to it when you actually graft yourself when you actually put your own touch to things you yeah. know i mean it does it speaks to that whole i guess and that or the, the that quote you know if you want something right you do it yourself oh yeah um, and oh, yeah. and like and like you know it's one of those things where you know yeah i mean it's lovely if you've got people to handle the editing and to handle the presentations for you fantastic but not everybody has that so you know, you then have to weigh up, well, okay, how do I make the best product possible that's as accessible as possible to as many people? But when you actually then get into it and you see the graft itself of like, you know, editing the videos, editing the audio, putting the features together, the intro, the outro, etc. And you then realize, hey, I did something. Like I actually did that and it feels really rewarding and you actually get a sense of value for it then. Oh yeah, like absolutely. Every individual episode you know, feels like it holds the worst to you specifically and then that carries forward in the product itself. Yeah, the worst thing for me is I put all this effort into the visual presentation to the point where I'm like super proud and push it out. 
yeah. the majority of my listeners are just listeners on the audio uh, yeah. platforms. I'm like, and they don't watch it. I mean, that's the nature of the beast, isn't it? I mean, I, I've always, as I like, I work from home. So for a guy like me who works from home, a visual podcast is very, very, very useful and entertaining at times because, you know, I do like to, even when I'm, even when I'm locked in, when I'm drawing and I'm actually, you know, fo- very, very focused on what I'm doing, I do like to listen to people. I do like to especially see them talking. I don't know why. It's just something I find very, very comforting is when, I see two people having a conversation up in like a, a little, you know, picture in picture window up on top of my, up on top of my screen. And I can just see like, you know, comedians or whoever it is that I'm listening to at the time. And they'll all be going back and forth with each other. And it feels like there's, you know, you, you see it anywhere in any job. Like if you've ever worked as like a tradesman or any kind of labor work, there's always a radio on, you know, oh, yeah. and that radio, that radio fills the space. It fills the empty space or the empty, you know, the empty air that that could be adding a little bit more atmosphere because like that's why you put the radio on because it doesn't make the, it it kind of softens the awkwardness because i mean most people don't want to fucking be there they don't want to do anything like that they don't want to be out in the rain they don't want to go to work so when you put on something that they find you know engaging and relaxing and enjoying or enjoyable then yeah it makes all the difference but then obviously you've got people who do commute they maybe have to really hyper focus they might work in a factory work with machinery they can't watch something as they're trying to not lose their hand like what is it woody harrelson and kingpin oh, <laughs> yeah the, the the bowling or something yeah he the, had the, yeah it was the machine where the balls come out yeah, that yeah, was yeah. Horrible. what a movie though. that's it but uh but yeah and, and we we share many well, I guess two two main passions um, that we talk about on the podcast, which is fighting and heavy metal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I love the fact that I can put it all together, that I can package it up and send it out, but that I have people that I can talk to about the very content that I want to get out there. And yeah. you started me off pretty much with the whole fight thing. Yeah. Like um, whether it be okay. UFC, like all the other fight organizations that were overshadowed and you know muay thai yeah. boxing jiu-jitsu like well it kind of it speaks to like how different we are as people so like i mean for you i mean from my my experience of growing up with you and and, and doing all the, the training and fight stuff and and music especially with you when you when you commit to something you lock in like you're hyper focused on that when i get into something I attach myself to it, but then I dissect it. And I think fundamentally that's probably what makes us very, very different as people, even though we do have a very similar temperament, we have a very similar way of, of going about things. Um, when you committed to training, your life became training. And like, I remember that, you know, I remember you going to the gyms and going to the, 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 fight classes and everything that you were doing all your fights the boxing matches the cage fights and you know and the jujitsu tournaments and whatnot i remember it all and your life was so committed to learning that craft and for me i wasn't as i wasn't competitive when i started learning you were more competitive than i was because you know you would play team sports more than i ever did and so when you locked into the competitive side of things, you know, your life became training, weight cuts, training, weight cuts, competing, mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. And yeah. then for me, I was actually more interested in the learning aspects of it. So I was actually, I, I didn't particularly give a shit about competing in jujitsu or Thai boxing or any of that stuff, or even in cage fighting. But I loved learning the craft of the challenge of it, of actually physically going one-on-one with somebody and trying to best them you know, and then trying to figure out more ways of doing it. And so when I was 14, I took on, I took up Thai boxing and I did Thai boxing from 14 to 20 and from 17 to 20, maybe 21, I was doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu parallel. And then I started to train with you in the city from time to time and we'd be in the cage. And that's where I kind of learned the ins and outs of how you use a cage to your advantage in certain situations like wrestling was new to me at that stage as well. <clears throat> One of your past coaches, Jake Hecht, I remember him yeah. showing me a couple of little little wrestling maneuvers that again are alien to Irish people because we don't do wrestling over here. Yeah. And I think we'd be great at it because rugby is 
almost like it's like a second love outside of our national sports. So I think there should be more wrestling trained in, in Ireland, but um, all that kind of stuff. I looked at, I looked at MMA like it was a learning skill, like it was a teaching tool. I love the way Joe Rogan describes it with jujitsu. It's like learning a language. And the more phrases and words that you have, the more you can handle yourself in a conversation, especially a difficult one. But <laughs> do, do you remember um, the, I forget the name of the comedian, but he was on Joe Rogan's podcast, uh, Eric Griffin. And Eric Griffin right. asked him, uh, jujitsu in a fight, I mean, does it work? Uh, <laughs> Joe Rogan said, well, if you, if you and I had a fight and I was only allowed to do jujitsu, I yeah. would kill you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's so true. Like I, I've given out to people when I first started doing jujitsu, especially was, uh, when I was in school, they were looking at me like, what, what are you doing? I was like, I do ground fighting. And they're like, why would you do that? Like fights are with your fists. And I'm yeah. like, are they, are they, yeah. and, you know, and, and they would always look at me like, well, yeah, if I was like, it's that logic, you know, you're a teenager. So it's like, if I hit him once, he's never getting back up, you know? And like, believe it or not, man, people are more durable than you think. And, you know, like where we, where we come from, I know you don't live in Ireland anymore, but like where, where we come from, you know, a lot of physical disputes are settled with a headbutt or a punch. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's it. It never really goes any further than that, you know, other than wild haymakers. Yeah. And when I explained to a couple of lads in my school, especially like when I was like six year, I was about 18 and they didn't know I was doing Thai boxing for like four or five years. And there was a, a dude who played hurling. He was a good friend of mine. And uh, we were taking, we were taking a piss one day out, out on the, it was PE. And I, I didn't really, I didn't play hurling or football. So I didn't give a shit about PE. And I was sat out in the dugouts with two of my buddies. One of the hurling lads came over and God love him. Like, you know, we actually were really good buddies, but he was in that kind of super competitive mode where he was like, if we got into a fight now, right now, what would you do? And I was like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't punch you. Like, and he's like, well, what would you do? I was like, I'd probably kick you. And he was like, kicking, would you stop? Like you wouldn't, you'd have to land it first. And I swung a tie kick at like 30% right into the crook of his knee. And like, he made this sound, you know, you know, that sound when someone would like, have you ever gotten hit unexpectedly and yep. everyone reacts the same way? You make like this sound of like a, a seal that can't get back into water. Like, <gasps> you know? And he makes this sound as his knee twists and he's like, Jesus. And he goes straight down and he looks up at me. He was like, yeah, all right. Yeah, cool. Makes sense. Makes perfect sense. And that was when I had my first realization that, I mean, what I've learned is actually super useful because again, I was only going 30%. And like at 18, I was training with dudes who were like 30, 35, had all previously competed. My coach at the time was like a former, I think he was a former European Thai boxing champion, Dan O'Callaghan. Oh, like, yeah, Dan. He was, he was scary good. Like, I mean, he was crazy for a, a small dude, just terrifying strength and conditioning, you know? And um, like very un unassuming kind of a fella as well. You'd never think that he was a killer, you know? And... Um, from that, you know, I kind of recognized that I actually love this. I, I don't, I was never a person who ever engaged in physical altercations. I never, ever went out looking for fights or anything like that. But I was always very sure of, I never wanted to be a victim if I could avoid it. You know, if I could avoid it, if I was ever out in the street somewhere, if I was ever out having fun or having a good time and somebody wanted to start on me, that I would never like recoil and, and become somebody who became a statistic of, you know, I got beaten up and there's yeah. nothing I could do about it, you know, because I go through life hoping for the best at all times, you know, instead I was, very, I, you know, I was very realistic about it, you know, <laughs> you know, Hey, we're going out having a great time on Saturday night. Okay. Yeah. You know, no, I hear so, you. It's, it's interesting. So like, sorry, go ahead. No, no, it's just interesting that, um, people who are in this fight game understand that, you know, it, this is a sport and so is football. You can't yeah. really use football on the streets, but people just no. assume because you learn all this stuff over here that now you take this to the streets. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's a useful tool if you're in the scenario. 
but you learn it so that you never have to use it. Yeah, you know? and that you have the confidence to, to, to know that if some shit's about to go down, that yeah. you can maybe take out two, but then you get the fuck out of there as quickly absolutely. as you can. Absolutely, like absolutely. Like, I mean, I, I have never, I can happily say in my life, I have never ever, like, look, when somebody is confident, and I'm not talking about bravado and posturing, I'm talking about real confidence, like you're comfortable in your own skin, you don't need to prove anything to anybody, you <laughs> can exist in life very quietly, and very happily and people who generally have something to prove are very loud very boisterous and they'll have no hesitation in telling you exactly what their insecurities really are if you're shrewd enough to spot them and like you know we've all seen it you're out in the city some night no matter what city you're in and there's always the dude who's got his shoulders back fists down by his knees and his chin out tap and out like, yeah 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 the old school tap out ink splatter t-shirt you know he might have a red mohawk or some shit and it's like just it's like, bleed yeah yeah that guy you know what i mean like i mean cliche is the cliche for a reason right and yeah you see guys like that i see guys like that all the time you know when i whenever i was younger i would see them all the time and it's like i would never engage with them just primarily because you're acting like an idiot and i don't i don't engage with idiots i'm sorry it's just not something for me but if one of them was to ever target me, that's fine. No problem. I have absolutely no fear of you whatsoever. And so I kind of noticed that, like, the reason I took up Thai boxing at all in, in, in when I was 14 was because, you know, I was in, a, it was in an all boy school. And, you know, you went to a mixed school. And the one great thing about a mixed school is that girls tend to chill everybody out. Right, dudes tend to not be as competitive with each other when there's girls in the mix. Right, there's like a there's like a level playing field there, and it's the same with the girls. The, having the guys present, there isn't as much competition between them, and it all kind of disperses. Now, there's obviously always going to be little spikes of competitious behavior here and there, but in an all boy school, you're locked in all the time. We were savages, like we were just non-stop at each other, you know. Yeah. And if you weren't if you were a sporty guy, you were competing with the other sporty guys. If you were a music guy, you were competing with the other music guys. That was just what it was. And I noticed when I was in second year, there was a lot of dudes getting bullied, especially by the sporty guys, you know, like, I mean, to use the cliche term, the jock, shall we say, you yeah. know, in Ireland, in Ireland, you could call them the guy head, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, GAA is a tough sport. I don't care what anyone says, right? I respect the hell out of, of, of Gaelic football and hurling. You have to be tough as nails to actually compete in that sport. And the reason I say that is like, over here in Ireland, we take it for granted. But when I watched hurling in America with American people, they were like, you people are fucking crazy. <laughs> like, yeah. this is insane. So it's raining, it's 400 degrees below zero, and you're running around in short shorts with wooden stick chasing leather. Oh, <laughs> yeah. and the referee is there for show. You know yeah. what I mean? Like that referee is not getting involved. You know what I mean? If two dudes start swinging that wood around, that ref isn't standing in the middle. He's like, no, nah, nah, they're just talking. They're just talking. <laughs> yeah. Try and watching, like, try watching a football game, like a, a soccer game after a hurling game. Oh my God. It's not even, it's not even close. But yeah. the thing is, the thing is over here is that, you know, the, the GAA mentality is super competitive, but they're not trained, a lot of them, like, I mean, there's a lot of dudes who are really cool and they, they just play the sport because they love it. But from my experience when I was growing up, a lot of dudes didn't know how to switch it off. You know, they were that competitive all the time. And like one thing used to really annoy me, there was a thing in my school where, like where I went, it was a hurling school. Like they had a really dedicated hurling team. And what they would do if you weren't a hurler was they, you know, they'd be, all the lads would be going around with a hurley and a slitter, just bouncing the ball and, and you know, doing little tricks and kind of, you know, that kind of passive thing you do, like you wouldn't call it fidgeting, but they're basically just kind of filling the space of waiting with playing with a ball. Yeah. And what they would do is they'd bring like the hurley right up to your face and start, you know, volleying the ball right in front of your face. And like, by the time I was 18, I was so fucking done with that stuff. Like, you know? <laughs> yeah. You know? And these guys, when I was in second year, you'd see the hurling team. They were very quick to, physically impose themselves on anybody who they felt like it. And I just quickly realized I was like, I I don't have any interest in that. But if one of them does, I'm not gonna just whimper in the corner. Too much self-respect to allow that. So 
I went and I started taking Thai boxing classes. And one of the guys who was training in the gym at the time ended up actually becoming a coach there. He ended up doing a lot of the training sessions with us. Uh, he now runs a gym in, in Middleton, um, Tommy Collins. Like, I love Tommy. He's a great yeah, coach. Mr. T. Yeah, really, Mr. T, yeah. yeah. And, like, Tommy, he's a really, really good dude. And I remember the first thing he ever said to me when I walked into that gym. I walked in this meek metalhead who had no physicality whatsoever, long black hair. And he looks at me, big smile on his face, massive dude. Big smile on his face. Like, Tommy, for a guy who could kill someone with his bare hands, has the warmest smile you've yeah. ever encountered looks me dead in the eyes he goes did you bring a gum shield and i was like <laughs> sure didn't and he's like awesome all right and i knew what i was in for then but the thing about me at the time when i realized think back on it now as a teenager was that i was game you know i maybe didn't look the sportiest i maybe didn't look the most athletic but i was game i was always up and the first time i got a proper hit to the side of my head inspiring you know most people expect the worst and they think they're going to freeze and they, i got hit i was so activated like my eyes widened yeah, my yeah. back went up i was like oh it's on you know when and you taste I, the iron of your own blood it's a different oh my god. feeling oh my god and you feel like the tension of the the, the gum shield in your yeah. mouth you know and you bite down on it and you realize like oh we're going you know yeah and that was when i realized oh i love this i love this i love i love the challenge of it i love the discipline of it I loved everything about what I was learning in Thai boxing. And, and I realized two years down the line, I'm really good at it. You know, I had no interest in actually competing, but I was really good at it. My kicks were solid. My knees were solid. My elbows were solid. And so I went into school then. And even the guys who knew me as not the, the hurling guy or the football guy, even they could see that there was a confidence in the way I walked around the school where like myself and yeah. one other friend of mine, a very close friend of mine, Jordan, he was a gifted boxer. He was raised in boxing from the age of like 11. His dad and his uncle and his cousins all used to box. And so he was raised with boxing. And the, 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 he, still to this day, the dude's got hands. Like he's got some serious, yeah. serious power and some serious speed. And he and I, we never played football. We never played hurling. We just went, you know, we mm -hmm. just went around the place like we, like we fit in with everybody else. And it's because we never made ourselves targets and we always had fun. We were always being silly. We were always having a good time with each other. So none of the bullying that I expected as a teenager at 14 was even present by the time I was 18 because I had done the right things to maybe establish myself as a peer amongst all the guys who would have. You know, it's that thing of like you eat the weak when you're in school. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I don't condone bullying. I fucking hate bullying. But, it's... you know, you hate each other. You talk shit to each other, you know? Yeah, it's a tough one. I was bullied heavily between the age of 12 and 18. Oh, primary school, man. I was bullied relentlessly, you know, yeah. in primary school. When I went to secondary school, I swore never to fuck again. And uh, it, like, again, no, no fight experience at all. Like, yeah. my confidence was only when I was playing music. Um, yeah. But I just have this wonderful memory of, of finding the gym in, in Little Island with Kieran O'Brien. Oh, yeah. uh, and and just learning learning jujitsu from the beginning um you know you go in on your first night and you're tied up like a shoelace but well, um, you got me into jujitsu i just remember going to the boxing clinic and doing yeah. just jujitsu there yeah and like learning how to box and then finding out that well i, I was kind of poached into increasing my membership because i was told i was very good um but yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I increased my membership and i remember getting very good very quickly because as you say fully fully invested in yeah. uh in just like finishing work and spending four hours in the gym which yeah. is like four times more like than anybody else was doing it people were just there for an hour and then going yeah. home but yeah. i i gold membership in the boxing clinic and i i would just be like doing jujitsu boxing sparring Your life cardio is there like exactly and i remember yeah. you showing up and i just i don't know why but i just maybe i, I wasn't paying attention to what you were doing but yeah. all of a sudden you had like four years experience on me and i yeah. thought i was going to show my brother some jabs and right hands yeah, all of yeah. a sudden you're blooding up my nose and i'm like what the fuck is this 
Well, I remember because you were you were after taking up jujitsu and you would like really I think jujitsu was your first foray into martial yeah. arts, whereas Thai boxing was mine. Mm. And so we were inside in Little Island. I remember we were in Little Island the first time I ever trained with you. And like I was so blown away by what jujitsu was. You know, yeah. I was so just shocked and awed about like, hang on, this guy basically did nothing and that guy was literally struggling for his life. What the fuck? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> how how is that a thing? Because I've been so trained and conditioned to fight, you know what I mean? Like stand up in front of a guy, use your fists, use your elbows, use your knees, the plumb, the clinch, all those things that I love doing. And all of a sudden I realized there's this whole other world that exists off stand up, off the feet. Yeah. And I remember afterwards, you know, you had been doing a touch of boxing up in the clinic, obviously. But we put on, I remember we put on like 16 ounce gloves. And it was that thing of you had a little bit of boxing, but I had four years of Thai boxing. And it was intense training, especially in the last two years, because there was a lot of dudes training to compete. And I was sparring with them. You know, I was going into the, into the ring with them and getting my ass kicked by a lot of these guys too. I, you know, I, I, absolutely no shame in saying it. But the guys who weren't ready... I was piecing them up and showing them why. Yeah. And that's where I think I kind of realized my skills, which was explaining things to people. And that's probably why now watching MMA, I love watching the fighters. I love watching the techniques and I love breaking it all down. But I relate more to guys like Trevor Whitman. Yeah. You know, because I see what he's seeing. You know, yeah. I see maybe obviously not to the same extent. Of course, he's an expert, whereas I'm just a, a very, very passionate fan. But I look at guys like Trevor Whitman and I'm like, that's the kind of guy I would be. If I was, if I would take my career and put it in MMA, that's the guy I would like to be. I would like to be the guy who puts down, like the mad scientist who puts down the blueprints that gives it to this cannon yeah. who can absolutely implement it, you know? But I remember the first time we put on 16 ounce gloves, you caught me with a jab. I was surprised by it because you caught me with a jab and I was like, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> my jab's and, good. Oh yeah, your jab was at, was brilliant. But what I realized very quickly with the way you were boxing, even at an early stage, was that you were very unorthodox. You're you very long arms. So Do you know why? Mm -hmm. I would I would spend hours watching Roy Jones Jr. on YouTube. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he just, does everything wrong the right he, way. I, I was I was referred to by my coach at the clinic, Stuart, um, as the worst best boxer in the gym. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a good compliment to get because at least now you're not predictable. Exactly. So I was, yeah. I found myself watching a lot of Roy Jones Jr. having no head, head movement and no good footwork, getting yeah. caught a lot in the nose, but just yeah. on, on, learning from an unorthodox stance, like a, yeah. like a, like a weird monkey pose. Yeah. yeah. Um, and jabs coming from like, not straight, but like the hip uppercut, yeah, yeah. like, you know, yeah. um, I, I liked all that stuff. And, I, it worked against guys who were just learning how to defend against just a standard jab. A conventional styles, absolutely. Yeah. You leave those guys alive because they won't expect it. Because there's a, that little gap in the elbows. Yes, you know? yeah, yeah. They're not covering up correctly They're, and all that kind of stuff. It's all there. But so it, I'm like, just go that way, you know? But like, I remember the way you used to hold your forward shoulder. And I Down, used to think yeah. to myself, I used to think to myself, like, your shoulder was so low. I was like, I'm going to fucking take your head off. You know what I mean? Because I did it to guys so many times before when we were just, you know, inspiring or anything like that. I remember the first time I trained head kick training in Thai boxing. I have never been more exhilarated in a training session in my life when I learned how to pivot on my front foot to get my leg up high enough to do a perfect, like, swinging roundhouse. Like, you bring in the leg up and then down. Like, you're yeah. going to hit this person with a bat almost. Yeah. And... I remember seeing your shoulder was down low and I was like, I'm going to catch you with a switch kick so easy. But then I realized the way you were moving wasn't conventional. You know, yeah. the way you were moving wasn't the conventional means of how a fighter learns how to move. You know, you weren't doing this kind of stuff and you weren't like fighting low, but you weren't doing like a Philly shell where you bring the shoulder up and cover up. No, no, no. Like yeah. it was just very obscure and I couldn't hit you. That was the problem. Yeah. So I had to get in a bit closer and I got stung by a jab. But I, I then realized, okay, so if I if I keep go going this way, he's going to keep piecing me with the jab. And that's when I was able to catch you with a couple of combinations. And that was when we kind of realized, right, this is where brotherly competition comes in. <laughs> Let's pump the brakes. <laughs> it's going to turn into an actual fight. But we both put a good one on each other. And I was kind of realized, all right, so 
you have a very good jab and clearly your boxing training is good. But to be honest with you, and I have no problem saying this, my hands were never great. Mm-hmm. Right? My hands were never really great. I was solid, like I could guard up, I could I could do all that kind of, you know, great, fantastic. Where I was really, really, really strong was a range. I'm a great counterfighter and I'm a great um reactor, you know, to whatever I'm given, I'll react in kind very well. Yeah. In terms of instigating, not the best. And that's why I always really envied your jab because my jab was good but yours was really strong but if i ever saw a guy take a step back i would throw my left kick and that was always my favorite maneuver was the tie kick always switch yeah. kick right left didn't matter but if i ever saw a guy take a step back i would drill a kick and i knew i had him then yeah. and that's where i could kind of compensate for my lack of skills with the hands was that as soon as i hit you in the in the side or in the leg and all of a sudden i've got your head thinking about that now then I could really get comfortable with my hands and I could start putting some combinations together. Mm-hmm. And I think that's probably why afterwards, when I kind of figured out that I'd hit my plateau with, with Thai boxing and kickboxing, you know, my hands were only going to get as good as they were. Like I was a good functional fighter, but I didn't have talent. You know what okay. I mean? I didn't have that extra special something <clears throat> that makes you, in my opinion, makes you want to pursue it as a career. Yeah. And when you then started showing me jujitsu and I started to train with Kieran and yourself in Little Island, it was like a whole new chest of toys to play with. You know, yeah, I was yeah. like, oh my God. And I really fell in love with jujitsu then. And I kind of realized that this is more my speed. And I had to relearn the types of cardio that you need because boxing and kickboxing cardio is completely different to Thai bo- or to jujitsu cardio. It's yeah. not the same thing at all because you can stand, I mean, in my opinion, back when I was in the height of my training, I could train for two hours heavily. I could train for two hours heavily and still, like I'd be out of breath, but I'd be fine. You know, I'd happily do another run. But yeah. if you do two hours of heavy jujitsu and you've been on the bottom for most of it, by the end, you will sleep for three days. You know what I mean? Yeah. You will sleep for three days. And that's why I've always respected guys who've gone the whole way and become black belts. It's like, You've committed to a different level. You know, it was the first time I ever saw a martial art that made me go, the belt system is so warranted yeah. in jiu-jitsu. It's so clear because a white belt to a blue belt, it's light years apart from each other. And if you're a white belt, mm-hmm. you encounter a purple belt. Oh my, like I remember when we started training in Little Island, Kieran was a purple belt and he was scary. Yeah. And he was fucking terrifying as a purple belt. And then you told me years later, he became a black belt. And it was like about time. Yeah. The dude was a, the dude was black belt as a purple belt in my opinion, you know. Yeah. And that that whole time was so special for me the uh the second half of 2009 all the way up until February of 2012. Uh just continuous training, continuous fighting as you say, weight cuts every goddamn month because I think yeah. after 7 months of competing like 7 months from start to finish, 7 months I did my first jiu-jitsu tournament. Um, yeah. once I started in the boxing clinic after nine months, I think, so from, from month nine and then forward another six months, I had my first boxing fight mm. and then simultaneously learning MMA. It was like, so such a special time. And when I was running this interview this morning, I was kind of thinking back on that time, like that super pivotal time for me. Yeah. Um, I would, I, I was living in Cork city and you yeah. know, that's about 10 miles away from Carrick tool. Um, so on weekends where I had nothing planned or I wasn't working or whatever, I would come home and stay at home. Yeah. And if it was a Saturday night and I wasn't going out, fights would be on and we'd have yeah. to, you know, you'd have to find where to watch the fight. And we would sit down at two o'clock in the morning, exhausted. Justin, Justin.tv. Justin.tv, the first live streaming videos that we ever had encountered. Um, but it was, it was one of those times where it was so interesting because, <clears throat> you know, UFC was still very much developing. You know, UFC was still so developing. I'm sorry I interrupted you, but uh, I was like, I, I just, but I, I remember, whoops. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> but it was Strike Force. Where, it was Strike Force was the, the pinnacle then for us ah, because we knew that so we knew that those fights were the better fights at that yeah. time. Because I remember saying it to you. I remember I remember saying, whoops. I remember saying it to you. No, but I do. I remember saying it to you because we were <sighs> watching we were watching UFC religiously. We were watching UFC religiously. 
And at that point in the UFC, GSP was doing the same shit every fight. Don't get me wrong, I love the guy. I love the guy. But GSP was just doing the same thing. It was John Fitch or Josh Koscheck, half guard for five rounds, and I'm going to get a safe win. No, I'm not saying the guy didn't work hard. He kicked ass the whole way up his career, no doubt about it. But it just became more of the same. And it was right around the time where Anderson Silva was also getting bored of the lack of competition. And he wasn't really trying too hard. I mean, we all remember, I mean, I would certainly hope people who watch this would remember the farce of him and Talis Lates in Dubai. You know, or was that? No, I no, wasn't Dubai. That was, that was um, Damian Maya. Damian Maya. Damian Maya. Yeah. Maya. But Talis Lates and Damian Maya, it was, they were just non fights, they were mismatches. And it was a disaster. So UFC would just. The main events weren't as entertaining as they used to be. And I was getting bored as shit. I was just like, GSP's fighting again. Great. Like, I know yeah. what's going to happen here. Like, he's going to win. <laughs> like, yeah. Anderson Silva is going to win. Whether you like it or not, he is going to win. But then I discovered Strike Force and I said it to you. I was like, dude. Yeah. Dude. And we watched it then that night up in your place. I put it on, and I think the night it was, it was Nick Diaz and KJ Nunes. No, I, I, I actually researched this, and I was about to say it as you, really? oops, interrupted me. Sorry, sorry. Okay, correct me then. The first fight that I ever saw back home with you was a Saturday night, and it was um, Strike Force Nick Diaz versus Cyborg. And you, okay. you had knew, you'd known who Cyborg was, and yes. you had told me about this guy called Nick Diaz. I had no idea who he was, right? Sure, yeah. And you said that this Cyborg guy is a Muay Thai fighter, an absolute killer. He will break your yeah. legs. And yeah, this, scary. and this Nick Diaz guy is a jujitsu black belt. But because he's such a stubborn piece of shit, he's gonna yeah. stand with him and yeah, yeah. strike him. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah, he's that kind of guy. Yeah. Um. So it ended up being Cyborg taking him to the ground, and yeah. because of the the it was like a trip, like a like a an inverted trip, uh, right. takedown. Nick landed in guard, got the underhook, um, posture down, got the yeah. armbar rotated, and just ended up slicking Pitch the armbar off. Beautiful, yeah, beautiful perfect. fight. That was the first time I watched that on the PC back in Carrick Tool that Saturday yeah, night. Yeah, yeah, the HP, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the white one, yeah. The big, yeah, yeah. The, it was a big screen. It wasn't I, an actual big, big screen, but it was a... It was, no, it was a, yeah, yeah, no, it was white aspect. No, I remember, I, that's where my mistake was. That was back at home. My, uh, I was talking about when we were in your apartment in the city. Yeah. The first strike force that we watched in one place in the city was when Nick Diaz defended the title against KJ Nunes, who was... Like yeah. super highly rated as a boxer and had won boxing championships before and he goes in against Nick and the two of us are like Nick is he's a stubborn like we had both become fans of Diaz after the, the, the cyborg fight so we were like shit this Diaz guy is no joke like he yeah. was just so entertaining to watch a guy just bald face not accept the fact that I'm a grown fighter but I'm going to beat the shit out of you you know yeah um, but when he went in against KJ and he was watching Nick Diaz in his prime out boxing a pro boxer was just so and like the amount of commentator like i remember frank shamrock was commentating it and he was saying like i don't understand why diaz doesn't take him to the ground yeah and it's like and frank this is why nick beat you because don't try to understand at that time don't try to understand the diaz brothers yeah you can't they are something else this is at, when at that time they were on a different level for sure they were just different types. They were actual fighters. Whereas yeah. at the time, you know, you were either a brawler or you were an athlete. You know, you either fell in the, the bracket of Robbie Lawler or Chris Lieben or you were a GSP or a John Fitch. Yeah. You know, you were a high level athlete who had competed elsewhere, came to MMA, or you were a Lieben or a Lawler who was just like, I'm going to bite down on my mouthpiece. I'm going to try and take your head off. Then you had the Diaz brothers who were like formerly, formally gifted at jiu-jitsu, like legitimately flawless ground game. But they were just built of that special stuff, that tough goon energy, you know? Yeah. Like if they were born in Canada, they would have played hockey and they would have been the enforcers, you know what I mean? Yeah, they would yeah. have been the Mighty Ducks who they brought in when the other guys were getting a bit too rough, you know what I mean? And, and that's just not present nowadays, you know? It's no, like you got a limited amount of stars and it takes me back to when UFC started to become good 
And when I started, when I lived up in town and you guys came up to my apartment, I would yeah. purchase the pay-per-view. We would go out yeah. the Saturday night. We would finish, yeah. get food back to my apartment. And then the pay-per-view oh, yeah. would be four times a year. Yeah, yeah. You know, beautiful yeah, yeah, nights. Yeah, yeah. I remember uh -huh. um, certain, certain pay-per-views. UFC 100. Ha, oh, oh. oh, ha. I remember that was a beautiful oh, night. Um, it was devastated when Frank last. Oh, Absolutely yeah, got it. I wanted him to beat Brock so bad. <laughs> yeah, but like in in that space of between 2010 to 2012, living in town and yeah. having the option to watch these sacred pay per views. Now, like the market is completely saturated because there's a pay per view yeah. 52 weeks a year. Well, it was a special occasion, and we had that um, the the anticipation. There, there was no pre fight press conferences. There was no build up no, there was no countdown show would be yeah no fight week the build up would be an hour before the pay-per-view so we'd watch that yeah. um you know there was no twitter there was no nope. uh, he's afraid to fight me on twitter yeah, there, there was no rumors no nonsense and there yeah. was no um there was no like ufc embedded so you didn't get like the fighters own personal interactions before the lead up all yeah, you saw yeah. walking you might have got like that glimpse you know, as they're on the prelims, you might get the glimpse of them shadow boxing in the in the dressing rooms. Yeah. But uh, like, I will never forget as long as I live. I will. It will go to my grave with me. It was the night the first time Shogun fought Lyoto Machida, and it was a packed apartment. Like it was such. Oh a, yeah. Like it was the it was you and me. It was all the bouncing staff from the Crane Lane. Maybe two or three of the bar staff. Kieran, all the dudes who trained in the gym with us. Yeah. Everyone had come together to watch Leona and Machida fight Shogun. And unilaterally across the board, even the people that weren't fans of MMA who watched that fight were like, Shogun won that, right? Shogun yeah. won that. And when the announcement came, it was so, I, I will yeah. never forget it as Jaw long dropping. as I live. Leona Machida's hand is raised. We see Dana White behind Bruce Buffer going, What the fuck? Yeah. Dana White was like, What? What fight were you fuckers watching? But everyone in the apartment at yeah. the exact same time reacted the exact same way. We're like, what? Yeah, and I'll yeah. never forget you. There was like a pizza box on the coffee table in front of the couch. And you just, <laughs> <laughs> you just flipped it straight up and walked out of the room into you. You were furious. I read because I'm a huge Shogun fan, you know? Oh, stop. Like you had met Shogun. Yeah. Uh, what about a, a year before that? Maybe two years before that. Yeah. So you were a big Shogun guy, and I at the time, I was doing a my, I was doing like a deep dive into Shogun's pride career, like with all his all his big big fights that he had back then, and and like the early fights in his career. Him and his brother Ninja. I was like, I'm all about Shogun. Yeah. I liked Toto, but I preferred Shogun because he was a Thai boxer, and I was like, yeah, fucking Mauricio all day, man, and then. For some reason, the judges saw it the other way. Yeah. But then, fast forward, and as you say, like there was only four a year. Fast forward five months later, and there's the rematch. It was the first ever instant yeah. rematch in UFC. It's beautiful. And uh, I was back go back, go back to that last fight where the, yeah. the apartment was full and you were sitting on the couch and you did this. Boo, boo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there was, and there was everyone is like 15 20 people there looking for their phones, but there was a couple of really really drunk people. So I was doing this impression of a phone vibrating on a wooden table, <laughs> <laughs> and everyone is freaking out, like, Who's the phone? And I'm just sat there, not moving, just looking side to side, like, Are they gonna uh, catch on? They were great times, but amazing. I'll never forget, I'll never forget, it was the first ever instant rematch, Shogun yeah. and Leonardo. and. They ran it back and Shogun knocked out Lyoto in the first round. Yeah. Like, Overhand left or was he southpaw? Overhand right? Steamrolled him. Just yeah. steamrolled him. And Lyoto's head bounced off the mat. Shogun went down after about yeah. one more. But I remember watching it on a Sunday morning. I had come back from work. I was I was working in the, the train lane. And I came back from work at like four in the morning. I'd gotten up at like 11 a.m. I was groggy. I was rough. I was just not in the form. And I switched on the fight, watch it. And the computer that we used to watch these fights on that you described earlier, the family computer, it was in like this unit, this like wooden unit that I think dad had made. It was like a yeah. desk, but it had like this overarching unit that you slotted the, and the unit was like a good, maybe foot or two above the screen. But I remember like <clears throat> we were so invested in UFC back then 
like, so invested that every event really mattered. Yeah. And when I saw Shogun right the wrong and knock Yoda out, I jumped out of my seat and I, I you know, Power Rangers ending, you know, put my hand in the air, right? Yeah. Fucking cracked my hand off the roof of the unit. Oh, it no. Was solid wood. And I was like, did you ever, what's the movie? Um, Scary Movie 3. Yeah. Scary Movie 3, when Cindy goes away and she leaves her kid with the doofy idiot. And like the guy that she's interested in, but he's a moron. He's the dude who goes rapping earlier in the show. But yeah. she comes in to the house and the kid's in bed, but your man is like face down on the table. Your man's face down on the table. She's like, is everything okay? It's fine. He's like, yeah, my head's really sore. I remember we were playing a game. He looks down, he's got a load of dice. And he's like, yeah, see? And he jumps up and he hits his head. And he goes back down to the exact same spot. That's Done. exactly what it was like. That was exactly what it was like. I was like so happy. Put my hand up, smash my hand. So I instantly went from unbelievable joy to like Will Ferrell. Like I immediately regret this decision. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But those those were special, special events because they were so few and far between. Oh, now now it's were. just oversaturated. But I mean, um, like... Uh, I don't watch many of them live now. Obviously, prior, prior and post commitments on a Sunday, they don't let me sleep a lot of times here. Um, but you, you've come to Switzerland. You've been here. You've visited yeah. me, and yeah. we we share another passion other than fighting, and that is our love of music. Yeah. And when it comes to our love of music, it's like the. You know, the memes where it's like there's certain small pieces that interlock. and Venn that, diagram. Yeah, we, we have that small piece. Oh, it's like a baby fingernail. Yeah. Um, um, I remember the first time you were here, you came from Megadeth. Yeah. Um, you're not a really big Megadeth fan. I'm not a big Megadeth fan, but I'm a bigger Megadeth fan than a Metallica fan. So I just enjoy right. antagonizing him. I've made this very clear to so many people, like yeah. even friends of mine here in Ireland, like I will gladly go out of my way to antagonize a Metallica fan for my own entertainment. Right. Yeah. Well, you've been like, to Metallica with me though. I have, I have, I've seen Metallica. I, I listen, yes. I listen, right. In my opinion, personally speaking, you only have the right to really rip the piss out of something. If you know it intimately, right. If you're so familiar with something that you can accurately make fun of something without it being nasty right i've been raised with metallica right i'm seven years younger than you so when i was 11 you were 19 yeah. and when you were in the height of loving metallica and like in my opinion a lot of people would argue with this but in my opinion when you were listening to metallica and when you were like lockstep with what metallica were releasing that was the best time for Metallica, as far as I'm concerned, because yeah. the early days, yeah, I mean, obviously the, the diehard fans like yourself and, and your friend Dara, like, you know, Master of Puppets, Justice for All, Ride the Lightning. Kill, uh, the kill glory it. days. The glory days, right? They'll always be lovingly looked at as the, the, uh, the golden era of Metallica, right? But what I remember was load, reload, um, cunning stunts, um, life shit binge and purge, like, yeah, I remember you having that on repeat constantly. Like I, like I can still to this day lyrically sing along with every Metallica song, right? Yeah, I can't fucking stand the band, and they still I every word, every word right here. Yeah. And I of course respect Metallica. Of course I do. I, of course I do. I think they're and Megadeth because you came here to see them. I really like Megadeth. I consider yeah. me, me. I would like. Looking at it objectively, I would say Megadeth are better musicians. Yeah, yeah. Metallica are better songwriters. And, and like, I mean, you look at like Mike Mangini. The drummer for right. Dream Theater. Well, he was the drummer for Megadeth. That's right. He used to drum for Megadeth. Right. So Mike Mangini, compare him to Lars Ulrich. I'm sorry, lads. We're not, let's not talk about it. You know what I mean? No, Lars has written some very iconic drums. Mike Mangini maintained his consistency more. So that's where I fall. I'm just more, mm. listen, I have no problem saying I'm a fucking snob, right? <laughs> I'm a snob. When it comes to musicality, I'll always fall on the side of the better musician. But yeah. that doesn't mean I disrespect Metallica's ability to write a damn good, damn catchy song. They do. They're excellent at it. Yeah. I'll die on the hill. I'll die on the hill of saying that St. Anger is their best album. I don't care. Well, I, that's absolute horseshit. But listen, 
I'm but not see, here to I'm argue saying. with you. This is what I'm saying, right? Because okay. I know by simply saying that alone, <laughs> it'll activate every Metallica fan to say, what? And yeah. I'm not saying that that's serious, right? That snare drum, it's divine. No, I mean, I, it, I, it's, it's the worst <laughs> sound in the history of, of music. It's tragic. Tragic. It's tragic. It's tragic. But... They were trying something. They were trying something. They right? were it, not trying anything. They were well, surrounded listen. by yes men who said, that's great, Lars. Right. Turn the volume up on that one. In reality, right? In reality, looking at it no. objectively, right? Looking you're at just it trying, you're taking the piss now and I'm not going to entertain any fucking saying that. What I will say, what I will say, the one thing, right? To, if I can offer an olive branch, right? What I will say is it is undeniable. It is undeniable. This is a fact. This is probably the only time I'll ever say this. Okay. And I'll say this on your podcast so that you can keep a visual document of this, right? Or a, a video document of this. Saint Anger and, and Justice for All are, are the easily the best Metallica albums, right? I don't care what anyone says, right? Uh, I'm sorry, Master of Puppets. I, I misspoke. Sorry. Master of Puppets okay. and Justice for All are the best Metallica albums by far, right? Sanitarium, Black End. Top class. But the best thing Metallica ever did that will unite all fans across the board, across their, what, 40 years now? Is it 40 years? 40. 40 19. years. s and Oh, yeah, for sure. s and is But the, with St. Anger, you, you, you have to look at what they were going through at that time. When you talk about the snare drum, I call you full of shit. Uh, but also, hey, Kirk, you're not allowed to guitar solo this entire album. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I agree with that. See, I love songs like um, like Some Kind of Monster is a great song. Yeah, no, right? for that, that That riff is phenomenal. And um, The Unnamed Feeling is mm -hmm. just an absolute banger. You know what I mean? Like, they're just, that's a fucking great song. That said, I defer to the fact that, yes, Sanitarium is probably the best power ballad that they've ever written yeah you know one is iconic of course yeah. you know what i mean but like as soon as people start to say that nothing else matters is the greatest messiah song ever written i'm like it's a great radio song yeah but fuck sure that go noise fuck <laughs> <laughs> sure go fuck yourself right you you also came for Ma uh, machine head that was a fucking great show you, you came for 24 hours you arrived Sorry, by to, to backtrack to backtrack for a, for a second it was mega that I came for the 24 hours. Ah, yeah, yeah, that's right. It was mega, mega. that I came for the 24 hours. But let me be very clear in saying, I am not the biggest Megadeth fan, but what I do love of Megadeth, I fucking love, right? Skin of my teeth. Yeah. Or uh, sweating bullets. Kick the um, chair. They're bangers. And like, yeah. to be fair, they put on a fantastic show. Like, I thoroughly mm. enjoyed Make it at that time and i'm glad yeah. to say i got to see dave mustaine live like i did metallica so like yeah. i only talk shit i i've said it like my buddy wayne especially he called me up on it recently he's like i remember having a conversation with you you said you actually really liked a lot of metallica stuff and i was like i don't know what you're talking about man you're full of shit <laughs> he's absolutely right but i'll never ever ever give somebody the consistency i'll always yeah. keep people guessing i remember when i said this to dara at metallica before <laughs> i was like after we had seen mastodon and avenge sevenfold and been blown away by them. Dara was super excited for Metallica, and I was like, "This is the worst part of the show now." And he lost his shit with me. Yeah. But um, but yeah, Machine Head. Machine Head was pretty cool. Oh. That was that was a good show. Um, they opened with Imperium. Yeah, that oh. was pretty sweet. That was a heavy night in Zurich. We ended up but in I, some house on the south side of the lake. Well, wow. we were in the woods. We woke up in the wilderness at yeah. like four o'clock in the morning. It's like my flight's in four hours. We had to Where get, are we? We had to get, um, we walked the train line because we yes. didn't know where we were. Uh, and we, we got, met the dude on the bike, yeah. the dude on the bike who had no fucking clue what we were talking about. We were like, yeah. can you show us the train station? And he like so brings us back. down a road. We got back to the hotel and uh, yeah, you got home safe and sound that, that afternoon. Just but that, that was a tough one. Um, but my, my most memorable show with you was the... Uh, jazz festival the Montreux jazz Montreux. festival uh, and it's it's memorable for many reasons but the fact that i'd seen slayer twice in that month um yeah. sugar and slayer were playing yeah. that night and yeah. i was i was seeing slayer in, in a week anyway mm -hmm. so i had no um i had no expectations 
I just wanted you to be happy because Mashuga, who you're a huge fan of, were yeah. opening for Slayer. Yeah. And it was like the height of summer 2016. Hot, yeah, 30 very, degrees. Yeah. Uh, the hotel was not that nice. Um, we had uh, air ventilation, which consisted of one small fan that you just pointed in one direction. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so we got to the show, sunburned, exhausted. But I just remember having such a good time. I'm not the biggest Meshuggah fan, but you turned yeah. me on to like two or three of their songs that they yeah. were playing. And I really enjoyed that show. But I remember the, the, the best part of that whole experience for me was after Meshuga, uh, we went back to the bar, we got two yeah. drinks, yeah. Slayer came on, and, you know, we were both exhausted. Yeah, yeah, it was and, a long day. And I think you were like, all right, let's, let's head on up to the stage and go nuts. And I just thought, do you know what, Kev? I'm happy to stay back here at the bar and just... And we had this universal agreement or this unanimous thing of like, hey, that's, that's, that's good with me too. <sighs> Fucking beautiful. <laughs> Because yeah. I, I wanted to be up close to Slayer, but I was seeing them in a week anyway, so I knew I was going on my own to that show. But the yeah. fact that I could just sit back and lean at the bar with my drink with you, just like, yeah. that was, was a fucking oh, killer it show. It was brilliant. And I, I think, if I remember correctly, was this after, it was after Jeff Hanneman died, right? Oh, yeah, much, much after. Um, yeah, it was yeah, after. If, Gary after Holt was playing. playing. Yes, and as far as I think, if I remember correctly, Paul Bostoff was back playing drums for them. I don't think Dave Lombardo was there either. Yeah, no, Lombardo was gone in about 2010 or 11. Yes, yes. Yeah, this was so, 2016. Yeah, so I mean, I mean, that was my first time seeing Meshuggah. And like, I'm a diehard. I'm, going, I'm actually going to see them next year as well. Yeah. Um, they have a new album. I think this will be their last album, so I have to see them before they go. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, They're playing they here too, so you're welcome to come. I've actually got tickets for May in Dublin. Uh, they're perfect. playing in the they're playing in the Olympia, which is my favorite theater in Dublin because the sound is just unbelievable there. Sweet. Um, I'm actually seeing Tool and Meshuggah within a month of each other. Oh wow! And I said it. I said it to a lot of my friends. It's like I'm seeing Tool and Meshuggah live. I may not listen to music casually ever again. Yeah. Because I why would I go on the swings when I've already been to Disneyland? Like, <laughs> but it, I mean. I remember seeing Meshuggah for the first time and like in terms of like my own, I guess, I, uh, campaign of being uh, becoming a better musician, you know, we both play the drums and our sensibilities are so clear from how we play the drums. You know, your sensibilities in metal would be more old school, hardcore, thrash metal and hard rock and, you know, Motorhead, Slayer, Anthrax, Metallica, you know, that real glory era <laughs> of course the music. Um, but like that real glory era of hard rock you know when hard rock like when a leather jacket was a leather jacket you know like that kind of stuff whereas for, for me I, I, I prefer I guess music that isn't as I get how in the best way possible I could put this music that isn't uh, I, in alternative the, like uh, the killers or uh... get fucked um, <laughs> no no um that isn't as predictable. I don't yeah. like to be able to hum a lot of these songs. Like I like catchy music to be catchy, fine. But in terms of like what really engages me is like if it's really, really difficult stuff or if it's really technically difficult stuff, that just, I don't know why I love the challenge. It's just a weird thing in me that if I see musicians, like for example, what first put me onto real extreme metal was Slayer. The speed that Dave Lombardo and Paul Boast have played as drummers, I was like, how in the fuck can a human being do that? You know, yeah. while everybody else is listening to Metallica and Megadeth, they're writing what you consider, in my opinion, the most radio friendly hard heavy metal or Iron Maiden or ACDC in hard rock and, and more classic metal. You know, it's very much melodically driven, whereas Slayer were just, we're going to hit you and keep hitting you. And I was like, oh shit, like that is a bit of me. And then I discovered Slipknot. And that was the end of it for me. Like, I'm sorry, if it's not going as hard as Slipknot, then I'm not interested. And like, I still to this day think that the first two Slipknot albums are the greatest heavy metal albums ever written. That's yeah, just yeah. my opinion. But like, I look at those two albums and they're exactly what I always wanted out of heavy metal. And to this day, nothing has touched them. Yeah. And with Meshuggah, it's just the level of technicality on display. 
and it's like these men are alive today and yeah. there are people there are people glorifying musicians who literally have no talent and there's this guy Michigan don't even do a fucking counting like Michigan don't even go all right lads next song one two three four and away we go no they don't even do that they just look at each other right we're locked in buddy of mine made an analogy before that Michigan are like they're a musician they're a group of robots from the year 3093 who came back in time to show us the music of their time there you go you know? man that's perfect that's perfect sense that's why when i saw them live it was so important to me because i'm like to play that live yeah that insane flawlessly that oh, was God. such a good show i'll never forget that oh my god Amazing. When, they played, when they played bleed yeah yeah they just bleed. Cl- closing our ears listening to the the drum ki- yeah. the, the the bass ki- kick kick drum oh flawless well like, i remember looking at you because you were still very new to Meshuggah. you had done your homework like you were you were after listening to a couple of their songs i remember there was one you really liked um do not look down i remember you yeah. really liked that one but i remember when bleed kicked in and it is this thing it's just, like it, it is like i looked yeah. over at you because this was again one of your first times really ever hearing the song and i looked over at you and you looked at me and you were like what the fuck? <laughs> Insane. And it was that it was that moment where we both realized like it doesn't matter what kind of metal you're into, that's just impressive. You know, yeah, that's man. just unbelievable. That's it, man. Fucking beautiful. I don't think we need to talk about anything else ever. This has just been beautiful reliving the glory days, man. Yeah, yeah. We had tell us very fun teams. Tell us, tell us what you're doing, what you're doing now with your current living your fucking dream. Well, I mean, I'm coming off the back of um, the release of Gunslinger Spawn, which was an incredible experience. Um, we probably haven't, I don't even think I've mentioned it. I draw comic books for a living. <laughs> You're talking about cage fighting and every metal. Yeah, yeah. I draw comic books. I'm an illustrator for a living and, and I, I like, I draw commercial art for, I'm, I'm freelance, so I work for whoever, I, you know, I'm a pen for hire, basically. Um, and having the breakthrough like i mean every commercial artist wants to break into the american the american industry the american scene comic books are massively popular in america they always have been and a lot of the guys i would have idolized and looked up to as a kid and teenager you know getting to work alongside those guys or just you know put my name on the on the shelf next to theirs that's you know the legacy stuff that i get activated by um so I got to work on Gunslinger Spawn issue one, which was released at the end of October, uh, just gone. Um, it's the highest selling new comic book series of the last 25 years. So you sound like, like you're getting emotional. This is beautiful. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's just one of those things where you kind of have to quantify it in your own head sometimes because I've been working so hard as an independent creator for years that, you know, I mean, from the age of eight, I've looked up to Todd McFarlane's work ethic and the standard he set artistically, you know, the quality of Todd's work has always been, like, I mean, I'm a child of, I'm a child of Image Comics. You know, I was born in 1991, Image Comics was established in 92. And Spawn issue one was the first independent comic book to sell over a million copies. And discovering Spawn at the age of 12 and kind of recognizing that this is this is fucking awesome like this is so cool and obviously being a huge batman fan seeing a character like batman who is you know inherently good whereas you have a character like spawn who's good with an asterisk you know spawn is good but he will kill you no make no mistake about it and that just always appealed to me as such an interesting character and seeing todd mcfarlane hit every benchmark like if there's a mount rushmore of comic book artists and comic book creators like todd's on it you know without a shadow of a doubt and you know the standard that he set artistically has inspired me and even like his best you i I wouldn't call him a student as such but greg capullo who was his main guy like when when todd handed over the reins of spawn he handed it to capullo and like capullo inspired me from the age of 13 on like still to this day is inspiring me you know (laughs) you're gonna laugh at me or some shit no you know it's those serious moments where i'm trying to focus and not fucking laugh and then you end up laughing at that thought so i'm trying to focus and it's just like 
don't laugh. Don't laugh. And then that's you're okay. laughing. Yeah. yeah, that's okay. But you got, um, you got contacted and then et voila, you're working with those guys now. Yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, I'm still very much freelance in that the sense of like, I, I, when they want me, they call me, you know what I mean? There it's go, that, man. it's that kind of way. And that, that's, that's fine. I mean, that's what this industry is now. No one, the, the, the old days of like the Marvel bullpen where you've artists all working in a circle and drawing yeah. each comic book and DC the same. And this is why I say I'm a child of image because Marvel and DC were established way back, like way back, like 60, yeah. 70 years ago. Whereas <laughs> back in the day, back in the old, uh, <laughs> You know, back in art four, we call it Cars <laughs> Walker. You know, cars but went yeah. out. You know, but your your but, your name is on that the like associated oh yeah. with those guys. Now you've got but this he, series here's the out. Crazy thing. Here's the crazy thing, right? So, on the inside cover of Gunslinger Spawn, I had to quantify this, right? What are you laughing at? I'm trying to focus. Well, what's what are you laughing at? I, it's it's not that I'm laughing at anything. I'm trying to focus on not laughing. If that makes sense. It's just yeah, me being a dick. I'm letting Lock it, it go. In. Locking Lock it, it in. in. Locking it right? in. But um, like I'm looking at the inside cover of Gunslinger issue one and the names on it. Like, I mean, there's Brett Booth. Obviously, Todd McFarlane is the, is the boss. You know, he's the guy who makes, he's the guy who gives everybody the ingredients to make the pie. But yeah. Todd, you know, his name is iconic. You know, he's the Guinness World Record holder for the longest running independent series ever. Like the man is just... Flawless, like like what was it? Bill Burr said, you know, he spent four decades in the zone. You know what there I mean? Go, like man. he's he's never faltered for a second. And then, you know, myself and there's another artist, Thomas Natchlik, um, who's a, a German artist. Um, I wasn't familiar with Thomas's work, but like I immediately took to it. I looked at it. I was like, yeah, there's a reason this guy is on this book too. And the two other names that I did know that I had history with was Brett Booth and Philip Tan. Now, Brett Booth has been in the industry a very long time. He's been around since the glory days of Image back in the 90s. He is a superstar. Like, he's a phenom of drawing. And to be in a book alongside him was unbelievable. But what was even crazier was Philip Tan was the artist on Spawn when I started collecting Spawn when I was 13. So when I was very young and I was going into the comic shop to buy Spawn comics, Philip was the artist doing interiors regularly and on there like his story precedes mine in, in issue one and i'm like holy shit man like that's crazy like there you go. like i'm 30 now so 18 years ago i was looking at your work and like damn that's what i want to be you know like that's that's where i want to hit and you know here we are 18 years later i i focused on very heavily the fact that this is possible now and here we are i had a book come out so no, I'm just kind of enjoying the fact that, you know, I had a break like that and, and I had a, I had been given the opportunity by Todd and by my editor, Thomas Healy, that they saw I was good enough to compete or to at least put my hat in the ring at that level. You know, I'll never not be unbelievably thankful for that because most artists never get it. You know, yeah, you, you got a lucky break, but you, you worked very, very hard for that lucky break. Well, and this is it. You know, now you're you, seeing the fruits of your labor. So that's we're all super proud of what you've done, man. I appreciate that. I really genuinely do. I mean, it's one of those things where, yes, the lucky break is the thing you can't prepare for. Mm -hmm. the, the, the random chance of, of having something like this, you know, come across your path. Yeah. But at the same time, like you said, like I do, I work my ass off so that if, and it's a big if, it's an underlined big if, but if, if that, opportunity does arise and show itself you're ready for it you know what there i mean you go, you're, re you're ready for it and it, it carries across if it's i know you're largely mma oriented so like comic books wouldn't really be a thing but they do coincide they do coincide i mean i always thought that even looking at fighters down through the years that's the closest thing to the superhero physique that we have in real life you know you can't tell me that alistair Overeem when he was on that special sauce didn't look like didn't look like superman you know what i mean well, so, I mean, what we're trying to correlate here on this podcast is the fact that perseverance, hard work, yeah. that no quit mentality, like yeah, yeah. Th this is everything that you learn in the gym that gets you to a fight, that gets your hand raised, or at the very least, you don't get your hand raised, but you know you've done everything in your power to make sure that you per like, perform, to perform on the night 
that yeah. makes you satisfied with how you performed um you can translate this across to anything and with yeah. what with what you've done with comics and your illustrations and your social media dude you're you're killing the game and we're just watching we're, well it's my pleasure but we're we're watching you in real time have this enormous success and you know i i hate seeing these fucking billionaires on instagram with their big suits use these very general terms that are supposed to motivate the lower and middle class because it's not tangible yeah. And yeah. when, when, when we push people in your direction and see your success right now as it's, mm. as it's happening, I mean, mm. people would probably think, oh, wow, well, this is where you get, this is your potential. You're only just getting fucking started, bro. So Well, your, your potential is limited by your imagination. You know? yeah. I mean, that is really what it is. I mean, if you, if you limit yourself, well, then congratulations, you've limited yourself. But yeah. you're right, like perseverance carries over across all streams, like whether it be music, whether it be cage fighting, anything that's niche. Podcasting. That podcasting. <laughs> is, it is, it's a struggle, man. It's a fucking yeah. slog. You have to really commit to it. And it's thankless. Yeah, right? it is. Like, I mean, I'll be, I mean, in a larger sense, I'll be known because of the gunslinger, you know? But... Mm -hmm. I've been at this a lot longer than that. You know what I mean? There's no such thing as an overnight success. That's a fucking myth. Like, yeah, yeah. this is not a thing. If you want to be a good fighter, and like, if your goal is to be a champion, you know what I mean? If you want to walk up to Kamaru Usman, or you want to walk up to uh, Charles Oliveira, and I choose those because they're the two most competitive areas of mixed martial arts, the welterweight and lightweight divisions, will always be the most competitive because that's I guess where the average body mass build fits if you want to walk up to those guys and take that gold off them you've got to work your ass off and the reason I say that is look at how Kamara Usman won the belt yeah he worked his ass off and outworked Tyron Woodley he went to decision and the first thing as the bell rang Joe Rogan said it ladies and gentlemen we have a brand new champion because yeah. Kamara Usman showed it right there and then he didn't use his words he used his actions and he took that belt from Tyron Woodley. And That's no it. one could argue with it. And so if you're looking to make a life in music, acting, podcasting, comic books, it doesn't matter. If you are hung, like my logic is, and I, and I have to say, I have, I have martial arts to thank for this. I never realized it at the time, but as I progressed in my life, I realized it after where I said, had I not had the discipline, like when I was 16, 15, 16 and 17, while all my buddies who I knew in school and played in music band and oh, music bands is the thing. When I when I played in bands with and I listened to music with and all these guys I was in school with on the weekends, they'd all be, you know, underage drinking, going bushing as we call it. And the good old days. And I wasn't a I wasn't a stick in the mud. I I never had a problem with what they were doing, but I preferred fighting. You know, I preferred going to training, getting my ass kicked for two hours and coming out of it realizing what kind of character it was building while these guys were all getting pissed no i wish them all happy lives i hope they're all succeeding i really do but i realize now in as i am 30 i've realized it's given me the type of discipline to realize yeah there are plenty of people who are hungry and want the career that i'm making for myself there you go man There's that's plenty it of people mm. hungry but i'm hungrier that's it in real time man i think that's good for today you got it do you have any final words for our listeners who may be fans of me or maybe fans of you? I do, actually. Hit me with it. In a world that wants you to be like Conor McGregor, be Wonder Boy. Oh, how wonderful. Absolutely, goddamn lutely, man. I couldn't That's agree I more. One in of the world, nicest guys. Yeah. In a world that wants you to act and behave and conform to the idea of being like conor mcgregor be wonder why right perfect outside of all outside of all the bluster outside of all the nonsense outside of all the things that conor has done right i respect him i do i respect his success massively and i lament his failings i really do because i don't like to see anybody whatever about my personal opinion i don't like to see anybody damage themselves their own reputation or their families but yeah, fuck Steve, that guy though, huh? <laughs> but Stephen Wonderboy, 
Stephen Wonderboy sets a standard that most people overlook. Yeah. Right? He will walk over to you and he'll shake your hand and he'll tell you, you beat me. Good job. Yeah. There you go, when Anthony man. Pettis, when Anthony Pettis knocked him out, he didn't strap off like a child. He walked over to Pettis and said, fuck, man, you got me. Right? Go. And if he beats you, he'll pick you up and he'll say, why don't you come train with me? Yep. Fucking words to live by right there, Kevin Keane. I love it. Man, thank you very much for coming on. Ladies and gentlemen, if you like what you hear or like what you see, do me a favor. Like, share, subscribe, follow, rate, review. I'm trying to master and say that quickly because it's, it's driving me nuts these days. No one's doing it anyway. So just fucking do whatever you want. I don't care. No, you stick with it. You stick with it. Like I remember, <laughs> look, man, I, look, <clears throat> I got you. My last point, and I'll leave you with this, right? I remember going to Comic-Con and no one buying my book. Right? There you go, man. Success in real to, time. Look at you now. I remember going to Comic-Con and having my book and doing everything I can to present it and just being overlooked. That's it. That's Even it, though man. I knew it was good quality, it was getting overlooked. So stick with it. That's all. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, rate, review. Share, tell a friend. Have them tell two friends. And they tell two friends. And they tell, <laughs> they two, tell two friends. friends. And, and, so friends. And, and so on. And so on. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you very much for listening, man. Kev, appreciate your time, man. Take care of yourself. Have a good one, brother.